I mean, the network here has been so stable, so good. I mean, what would you expect from having what would we What would Wikimania be doing? Without it uh, not functioning. Yeah. I've been to five minutes, I didn't work properly on any of this.
participate in this. Can I just get you all to hold your chins for me, please? Can you hold your chins? Man, how many people actually, you know, know the difference between your chin and cheek? No? This is your cheek? your chin. Oh, man. That was just a sound check. You can Oh, really? No, I, I, leave, I leave that for the speakers. But uh, I'm, I'm, uh, my name is Ahmed. I'm going to be the host for the session. You should not hear from me unless the speakers go over time. Um, I will uh, hand over to our three speakers. We're not planning to have a fire drill. If, if the fire alarm does go off, please do the building um, and you know take your stuff very quickly. But if you have to leave your stuff here, um, that's also important. We need to get you out of the building as quick as possible. Uh, you might have seen you might have seen toilets just as we come in. There will be coffee uh, in the spirit of Wikimedia. If you don't like the session, you can leave. Just please leave at the at back end. No, no, that's not for you. Oh, sorry. I mean, you will not leave, of course. But if you would like to leave, please leave through the back door to not disturb to, 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 to many people. Only if it's a matter of life or death, though. Wow. Well, I don't know what you signed up to, but... Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over to Andy, um, who's going to do the instruction about uh, his session. Also, you know about the app, and you also know about the hashtags, so I don't need to say them. Um, and enjoy and uh, can I just invite you to grab those for our speaker maybe? <laughs> Hands up everyone who wants to go and do this outside instead of in here. <laughs> We've got some real English weather at last, because we're American. <laughs> can you all hear me okay? So that's me, that's my Twitter name and my Wikipedia name. I'll give you my Twitter name, so if you want to be rude about me instead of doing it in here, you can do it online where I won't know about it until later. 
The Rijks Museum have made all of their uh, digital media open license, fantastic uh, volume of wonderful, uh, massively important in terms of history of art images, uh, marvellous. We thank them very much for that. The British Library put a million images on Flickr. Uh, 16,000 of these so far have been imported into Commons because they're uh, uh, public domain, the copyright has expired. We're gradually uh, cataloguing and uh, categorising them, uh, and you can help out with that task. Thank you, British Library. It's marvellous to have such a, a, a volume of material that you're working so closely with Wikipedia. They've had a Wikipedia in residence. The National Archives of the USA uh, have had a Wikipedia in residence, now a permanent position, the first permanent Wikipedia in residence in the world. Um, again, absolutely marvellous. The support that they've given to the Wikimedia movement is immeasurable. And of course, the British Museum here in London had a Wikipedia in residence. They arrived the very first Wikipedia in residence. All of these massive national, internationally renowned museums are valuable partners, and I don't mean to detract from them in any way whatsoever when I say I'm just as interested in the small local museums in your hometowns, in the suburbs, run by a bunch of amateurs in a shed, because what they have might not be as numerous, but it is just as valuable. So I've been a Wikipedian in residence. This is where I was the Wikipedian in residence. This is Shugborough Hall in Staffordshire in the English Midlands. Actually, I wasn't the Wikipedian in residence at Shugborough Hall. I was the Wikipedian in residence at Staffordshire County Museum, which is based in Shugborough Hall, in the stable block. <laughs> <laughs> but it was still a very valuable experience. I've been the Wikipedian in residence at the New Art Gallery in Warsaw. Warsaw is a small town. It's contiguous with Birmingham. It's just to the north of it very close to where I live, has a, a marvellous art collection, which I'll show you a little bit more later, uh, which they got because national museums didn't want it, because the condition of the bequest was that the collection be displayed as a whole and not broken up. And I've been Wikipedian in residence here, uh, not in the chimney, but in the mill <laughs> next door, which is Queen Street Mill in um, Burnley in Lancashire, uh, which is the largest surviving steam-powered cotton mill in the world. That's the inside of it. If you go in there when it's working, you have to wear ear protectors. And you might recognise that. If you know the Oscar-winning film, The King's Speech, some of the scenes were filmed inside that mill. I've also been Wikipedia in residence... Sorry, I've also run Wikipedia programmes at places where I wasn't formerly the Wikipedia in residence. This is one of the most popular, and that's why. This is the Black Country Living Museum, just outside Birmingham. It's one of those museums where they dismantle threatened buildings, re-erect them, uh, and open them to the public, and that includes their 1930s English fish and chip shop, where they fire the range that they cook the fish and the chips in with coal, and they cook the chips not in oil, but in beef dripping. The feedback forms for this event said, what was the best thing out of the day? And all of the people who weren't vegetarians said the fish and chips. And all of the people who were vegetarians said the worst thing was they couldn't eat the fish and chips because it was cooked in beef dripping. So if you want to encourage Wikipedia volunteers, feed them. <laughs> so if you're going to work with a local museum, whether you're in residence or whether you're just helping out as a volunteer for a couple of days, or if you're a chapter working with them, this is the first problem you're going to encounter. We've got Wikipedia articles now in all the big national museums in most countries, but for a lot of small museums there is no article still. Now if you talk to some people, they will tell you a Wikipedia in residence should never edit Wikipedia, or should never edit about the institution where they work. I'm afraid I don't agree with that. Um, I think as long as you are sensible about how you edit, you're careful to comply with Wikipedia policies, and that includes being upfront and declaring what you're doing, it's perfectly acceptable. So I wrote this about a museum I work with. But first of all, I declared my interest, then I wrote it, then I asked independent Wikipedians to look through it. And I was very careful. I didn't say, this is the biggest or the best museum, or uh, you really should go and visit it, or anything that might be considered promotional. I simply stated the facts. It's a museum. It's here, in this place. It opened in this year. It's operated by these people. All these things are cited. And I mentioned the, the painting you see in the bottom right hand corner, partly, which is their notable exhibit. It's quite a well known artwork locally. And I gave references for all those things. So I was clear to, clear to do it by the book. Now, other people will hopefully expand that. But at least now, there was something to point to for all the other things we did in conjunction with that museum, including something for people who might come along to help out, to have a look at, and see what it looked like and where it was. 
And of course, once you've created an article, and by the way, don't forget to put your info box in the top right-hand corner when you do that, because that's machine-readable data when you create an article. I then put it into Wikidata, and a lot of people miss that step. So uh, make sure that there is machine-readable linked open data in Wikidata about your little local museum. And then, if you're going to be uploading images or other media to Commons, excuse me, make sure you create an institution template on Commons, which you put on the page about every piece of media that you upload that's taken at or of an object in that museum. Because this, or gallery, or I'm using museum as shorthand for all the glams, uh, because this helps to plate all the things together and tells people where they are. So, once we've done all that, we have an event at a museum. Now, there's one thing you can do in small museums that you're unlikely to do in a large museum. Two things. One is to have an event while it's closed to the rest of the public. So a lot of these museums only open part-time. So you can go along when, on a day that they don't normally open by agreement. And the other thing is, as in the West Midlands Police Museum where this was taken, you can get them to open up the display cases, take the glass from in front of the object so you get much better quality pictures. You won't get the British Museum doing that for, for a bunch of Wikipedia volunteers, or at least I'd be very surprised if a large museum like that would do that. But in a small museum, that's more likely. You have to be respectful. If you're going to handle objects, you have to ask the curator's advice on how do you handle them? Should I wear gloves? Would you like to handle it instead of me? Uh, does your insurance cover me if I drop this, or even assume it? But you, you, you've got much better access in a small museum. As you can see from some of these pictures, we have a really wonderful photographer came along. Now, the West Midlands Police Museum has virtually no budget. It's run by the West Midlands Police. They have a budget to fight crime. It wouldn't go down very well if they were spending it on museum objects. And the museum volunteers who run the place don't have the skills to apply for large grants and get lots of funding. Uh, and because they don't open very often, they're, they're not eligible for a lot of funding. So they don't have photo photographs like this in their collection. So as part of this exercise, we took hundreds of open license pictures, which they can now use on their web page and in their promotional work. And we're quite happy for them to do that. This is all about the openness and sharing of which we as Wikipedians and Wikimedians are all so proud. It's also the only event I've ever been to uh, where we knowingly had heroin, uh, which they exhibit in the museum. And it's the only event I've been to uh, where we, somebody turned up with a machine gun. But it was the police armed response vehicle who dropped by to say hello to us and let us photograph their equipment. So don't expect that every time you work with a small local museum. The other thing you need to do if you're going to work with a small museum and you're going to run an open event like an editathon is involve other Wikipedians. I have known people try to run an event on their own, and if you get 10 people turn up saying, How do I edit Wikipedia? you're going to spend all day teaching them that and not actually getting anything done, anything Wikipedia wise done. And you're possibly going to spend all day teaching them to copy and paste and open tabs in their browser and install a virus checker. So make sure you've got some support on hand. This is Harry and Doug, who are two of the UK Wikipedians who came down to the police museum. So, you've got your event, you've got your relationship with your small local museum, what else might you get? Well, you might be surprised and get some international quality artwork. This is a Van Gogh, a drawing called Sorrow, and this is at that museum in Warsaw. There are three versions of this building, the other two, sorry, three versions of this drawing, the other two are in national museums in Holland and in America. But this one is in this little local provincial museum. We already had a copy of it on Commons because it's so old it's out of copyright, so somebody had been to the museum website and uploaded, I don't know, the 50 kilobyte JPEG of the image uh, to Commons. But the museum very kindly gave us the, whatever it is, 40 megabyte TIFF version of it, which is obviously far higher resolution, much better quality, and better color corrected. So you, you get some really good stuff that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find in a little local museum. But you also find interesting local curiosities. The same art gallery has this picture of the town of Warsaw from many years ago, and in the foreground is a horse racing course. Now, I live closer to the centre of Warsaw than the centre of Birmingham where I live, and I didn't know that there had been a race course there. But this is now on the article about the town in the history section saying it used to have a race course. And as far as I'm aware, it's the only image in existence uh, that's contemporary with that race course, tucked away in a small local art gallery. And this is also in that gallery. This is a painting by a guy called Ellis called A Date in Hampstead, which is a little village uh, also on the edge of Birmingham. 
Uh, this is now the site of a housing development, and in between times there was a coal mine there, but very nearby is a nature reserve. And because we managed to get a large tip of this image put on Commons, the nature reserve now used in their material when they talk about habitat loss. And some friends of mine who are botanists wrote a flora of the county describing all the wildflowers of Ivan. And again, they use this image to illustrate that book because it was available as an open under earth and license. So not only does your small museum provide you with useful things for Wikipedia and for Wikimedia Commons, but useful things that other people are going to use. And your job as a Wikipedian is to be a conduit for that freeing up of media and information. So go back to Staffordshire, when we were in the uh, County Museum in the state of the Hall, uh, they showed me some puppets. And uh, I went and had a look on Wikipedia, and then there was a mention of them. The last but one thing George Bernard Shaw wrote before he died was a play, a 20 minute play, for a puppet theatre near where he lived. Presumably he did it as a favour to somebody, it wasn't going to be a big earn for him. And we have an article on Wikipedia, part of which you see here, that said there were puppets. The museum at Staffordshire has three of the six puppets from that play. So we were able to add a section because their volunteer curator knew about the history, had the journals in his personal library that we were quoting from. But you'll also notice we put the accession number in the references, uh, purely for want of somewhere to put it in Wikipedia. Perhaps it should be better in Wikidata. <coughs> um, but not only could they tell us about the three puppets that are in that museum, but they know where the other three puppets are and which museums those are in. So a little bit of very useful knowledge. You wouldn't think if you were researching George Bernard Shaw to go to the Stables Museum in Staffordshire to look at puppets. You'd go to the British Library and read all his correspondence maybe, but you might never find that out. So the things that you're looking for might be tucked away in places you don't expect to find them. And quite often, serendipitously, you will find things that you weren't looking for when you go to these places, and you'll be able to make contributions all over the Wikipedia projects and others. Um, that's a duck's head, but it's a Roman duck's head, which was in Derby Museum. This is, again, an example of taking the glass off the front of a cabinet. I got 20 pictures of that that were useless because of the reflections on the glass before the curator at the event that I was at said, let me unlock that for you. <laughs> How often does that happen to you when you're in a museum with a camera? <laughs> Once they know you're a Wikipedian, that's the thing that does the unlocking, not the key on the key ring, that's just a tool. It's your Wikipedia status that unlocks these things for you. Uh, you even get dead pigeons. Uh, uh, now, that is a dead pigeon, it's stuffed in a museum, but there's a story about that pigeon, which I've written into a Wikipedia article, which is now in 20 languages, because it's so interesting. And you'll have to look it up if you want to know the story, I'm not going to recount it today. But I only found out about it because the curator invited me to go into the storeroom and look at it. It wasn't on display at part of a Wikipedia event at the museum at Dublin Darby. There was that much interest in that story, once I went on Wikipedia, that they took it out of the storeroom, they brought it a new display cabinet, and it's now on display in the museum. That's the power of having the Wikipedia article about something. And yes, before you ask, it is notable. <laughs> you have bits of social history in museums and galleries. Cigarette machines. You won't find a cigarette machine like that in a lot of national museums. But local museums have all sorts of things that can go to articles, again, not about the place. This went on to the article about the Wills Tobacco Company. It's the only image on that, that article. It's the only image on Commons, where it was when I took it, of anything to do with that company. And that's in the Staples Museum in Staffordshire. You get a bit of humour as well. Persons throwing stones at telegraphs will be prosecuted. Presumably they mean telegraph posts rather than telegraph messages, but you never know. I did some work with the Royal Birmingham Society of Artists, which is a venerable old institution in my home city. Uh, they have a gallery, uh, which is not much bigger than a shop. They run some very nice exhibitions. Their current members are artists who tend to paint watercolours and quite traditional art for the main piece. They sell a little bit of jewellery made by their members. But down in the basement, they have an archive, not much bigger than the Bay Area of that out to the end of this desk, a tiny little area. You can't get more than two people in it at a time. But that archive goes back through their entire 200 odd year history. They have all their minute books from the very first day that they were formed. And they have one artwork by every artist who's ever been a member. The condition of membership is that you donate an artwork to their collection. This is a drawing by one of their founders, um, one of the Lyons family, and they, um, John Lyons, I think, 
They bought the Lyons Family Sketchbook at auction with a, with a grant from one of the national institutions, uh, which were separate papers that had been bound into the book. They had it unbound, treated for, um, uh, to conserve it, and then it had each image framed. But before they had them framed, they had them photographed, and they gave us a CD with all the images on it. That's a nice, pretty little sketch, but it's a 200-year-old pretty little sketch, and it's the only image of that village at that time that we have. It's pre-photography. It's certainly pre-iPhones and Instagram. So they thought they were giving us a mildly interesting piece of art that might go on the article about the artist. But to a Wikipedian, that's local geography. And again, this wonderful church doorway, which the Victorians improved, as was there once, so this doesn't exist in this form anymore, goes on to the article about the town where the church stands. And there are other pictures in that series of churches and bridges and whole towns that are absolutely invaluable as a topographical record of the place. They didn't see that. That's in the, the archives of an art gallery who see it as art, not as historical documents. So we're, again, we're unlocking these sorts of things. And let's just think I'm fixated with Birmingham or indeed even England. In Kosovo, there's this lovely house, which is now a museum, where I took a photograph of the funeral garments that a dead Albanian would wear, or rather be dressed in. Um, and again, I've never seen that anywhere else. The National Museum, which is in Kosovo, just around the corner, didn't have this. But this little house museum did. Everywhere you go, once you start looking, you start seeing things, and you're thinking, which Wikipedia article will that illustrate? Because yes, I could put this on the article about the museum, but I could also put this on the article about funeral customs in Albanian culture or in Kosovo Albanian culture, if such a thing existed. Uh, existed as an article, I mean. Of course it exists as a culture. Uh, just another image, this is from the Strasbourg Museum of a stamp from the Rhone and Rhine Navigation Company. So uh, again, you can imagine the use for that. So very quickly then, who knows about QRpedia? Just a few of you, I'll, I'll rattle through this section. This is that Van Gogh drawing I showed you earlier, having a QR code put underneath it at the gallery in Warsaw. And we run a program called QRpedia, which we often apply in these small museums. You go to the QRpedia website and you paste in a Wikipedia article URL. It doesn't matter which language you paste it in from, and you get a QR code. You then laminate or cut out that QR code once you've printed it, and you stick it on exhib exhibits in a gallery. And when somebody scans that code, we detect the language that their device is using. So if a French-speaking person whose phone uses French scans it, they get the Wikipedia article in French if it exists. If they're German, they get it in German. If they're Japanese, they get it in Japanese. Some articles on Wikipedia exist in 150 or 200 languages. <coughs> you know, the big subjects like Monet and Van Gogh. If, if you're talking about something more local, maybe you can link to something more generic, or you can ask Wikipedians to help you translate the article, which is what I did with the Dead Pigeon article. Small museums have, usually have very little budget. They don't have the resources to produce leaflets or labels in French or German. They probably don't know which languages are going to be most useful. In England these days, it might be more useful to have them in Czech or Polish, because we now have migrant communities who speak those languages. This provides that for them, and this is your way in. You go to the museum and you say, I can provide you with free interpretive material in all these languages if you'll put these codes up. And by the way, while I'm here, shall we have an editor farm? Can you donate some digital images? Can we work together on other things? I'm just quickly skipping through that. Those are very small, as you saw. They can be bigger like this. That's my friend Laurie displaying to at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. They put those where the queues form for their lovely carousel that children can go and ride on and it gives people something to read while they're queuing. It doesn't have to be in galleries and museums. We use them in pubs and railway stations and churches, which are, in effect, museums of local culture, certainly if they have a good history. We put them on graves. This is in the uh, Congressional Cemetery in Washington, D.C. So we have them on individual graves, with the permission of the cemetery owners, of course. And we have the Monmouthpedia project, where we put them in a whole town, in conjunction with the two or three local museums there. If you want to know about Monmouth Peter, I don't have time to tell you today, but look it up, it's a fascinating story. The other thing to remember is there are archives that aren't professional museum library type archives. There are people or community groups who keep collections of things, whether it's documents or objects. 
This World War I gaming toy that you play like a dice game belongs to a guy in Birmingham who collects material related to Sikh people in World War I. And this belonged to a Sikh soldier who was an engineer who made this in a factory somewhere in the Midlands and went off to war with it. Fascinating bit of art. And he just let me photograph all the things in his collection. So you can find archives in the most unusual sorts of places. One of the archives I work with is the West Midlands Police who have a helicopter and they let us use not the crime scene pictures that might be used as evidence, but the nice pictures they take for publicity purpose. Just by asking them, please can we have those pictures under an open license? Now, I couldn't take that from my helicopter if I was a millionaire, <laughs> I've got one, um, because that's closed airspace. Only the police, the military and the air ambulance are allowed to fly there. So what a wonderful, valuable picture of the centre of Birmingham just by asking nicely somebody who has an archive of pictures. I'm out of time, that's me, and I can answer questions for one or two minutes. Hi. Hi, I'm going out of Chicago, and one thing I know- Great city, I'll tell you, man. Thank you. Um, <coughs> the uh, issue I'm facing with my institution is that because they're small, um, uh, I'm trying to get image donations from them, uh, from their digital archives, but uh, they're concerned that by doing so, they will lose funds from yes. providing high quality scans, so I've all been able to obtain low quality, uh, like low resolution uh, images from them. Is there any, is there any, um, I guess, line of argument to to try to convince them otherwise without creating too much friction? Yeah. First of all, you ask them how much money do they make, right? Right. And then you ask them how much it costs them to process the payments. And if the amount is negative, it certainly won't be very large. <laughs> okay. So that's the first step. The second thing is you say, well, the Rijks Museum can afford to do this, and they do it with Rembrandt's. Why are your pictures so much more special than that? Fair enough. Thank you. I mean, you could perhaps make slightly longer arguments, but that's, that's it in a nutshell. Let's have a chat afterwards. Any other questions? Hi. Uh, what is the name of the article, Mr. Pigeon? It's called The King of Rome. Thank you. Not King of Rome. It has to have the in front or you go to the wrong place. Anybody else? Hi. Uh, I believe somebody's done it, I'm not sure where. I tried to get it started at my local botanical gardens and unfortunately it fell through in the end. But there's no reason why you shouldn't do it. In fact, what you'll probably find is that botanical articles exist in lots of languages, so it's a good subject to do it with. And they have the technology that the, the label in the cemetery is actually <coughs> using the equipment for putting labels in botanical gardens because that's what they do in botanical gardens. So that's a very good instance. I know Sofia Zoo in Bulgaria use them on animal cages, and I'm sure somewhere somebody's doing them with plants, but I can't put a life on the thing left. Last question, anyone? That means you've all understood it perfectly. <laughs> You're all going back to your local museum on Monday or Tuesday morning, or certainly after next weekend, and you'll be talking about this here next year. I look forward to that. Thank you very much for your time. Then. is uh, Jimmy Wells, and for a second I actually wrote it down, just in case, because I thought he might be known as Jimmy Walsh too. And somebody mentioned that you're very famous, so... Infamous. Infamous, sorry, that's what it is. So uh, I, hope, I hope you guys enjoyed that session. Um, we're now going to be moving on to our next session, which is going to be a panel discussion. So uh, I'd like to invite our three... Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to uh, Lydia, who's going to introduce yourself and the panel. Um, again, I'd ask if you want to leave, please leave through the back door, and uh, hopefully you'll be here for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, thank you all for attending today. Once again, I'm sessions of this year's Wikimania. Um, welcome to the session, to the highly mysterious session, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the Secrets of Local Glam Outreach. Uh, my name is Lily, I work for Wikimedia Germany in the Department of Politics and Society, and I'm involved in a lot of um, different Glam activities, and uh, many of these are uh, targeting the Glam volunteer community. 
and um, try to, to create relationships between lab volunteers and cultural institutions. Um, and it turns out we're not alone. Um, many people do this too. Other chapters have um, um, different strategies um, about local glam outreach, and some people in this room might um, do some efforts in this too. So uh, we would like to show you three examples of um, different local glam outreach strategies, and um, then point out what works well amongst all these strategies, some points that we learned uh, that work, work out good, some points that should be avoided, and we would like to um, discuss this with you and um, to share some experiences about it. All right, so um, let me introduce you to um, Axel Petterson. Um, he is, uh, 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 he is, uh, sorry. Um, where is he? He's a project leader uh, for GLAM Outreach in Sweden. And he will tell us something about his um, local GLAM Outreach um, approach. Then we have Lars Albig here. Um, he is with Wikimedia Norway, and he is a long-time Wikipedian for around 10 years now. And actually, uh, since this year, he is a Wikimedian in residence in the National Library of Norway in Oslo. And then this is uh, Raymond. He is uh, a long-time German land volunteer. I highly appreciate the Germany uh, because he's really a relentless in, in uh, content liberation. And he will tell us something about his local land work in Cologne. So, um, I would like us to start. Do you want to come up and Yeah, um, we've been quite fortunate in Norway because um, we've had quite good advocates for GLAM within the GLAM sector. So, this meant that we could start <coughs> putting on uh, putting on public workshops um, because these advocates were quite high up in the glam sector. That meant that directors of different museums started coming and saying, you know, oh, we should do something with you know Wikipedia. Come come and do something with us. So this meant that we could do more kind of partnerships and do public workshops that we have in collaboration with the institution. So basically they're hosting a editor on <coughs> a thematic yeah, uh, for example, we did it with the uh, National Film Institute, and that was coinciding with a competition, a weekly competition on Norwegian language Wikipedia, Norwegian, Bukmal, uh, uh, Sami, yeah, all the, all the languages in Norway. And basically, the competition was about Norwegian cinema, and we did an edit at home, and you know, public outreach with, with the yeah, with members of the public as part of the institution, let's see. I'm not four minutes, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's probably not. Yeah. Well, just try to... Yeah, uh, one of the things that worked really well was uh, to um, collaborate with the institution. Um, so, for example, uh, they would do some outreach. They would get people come to these kinds of um, exhibitions and now um, workshops and we would be the ones you know helping and introducing Wikipedia and yeah that's yeah that's pretty much yes I want to say something about my work at Cologne uh, I do not have a room to answer at the moment but I work in progress um, I'm doing GLAM activities in Cologne since some years. It's uh, hard work uh, to convince the uh, institutions to work with us. Uh, but I think uh, it's get better and better. Uh, one, uh, a few tips for me, uh, for me for work in your city. Um, get in contact with the relevant people. Get in contact with the directors of the archives, of the museums, or the curators and introduce yourself whenever possible as Wikipedia. Sounds strange, but uh, be sure to say, oh, you are a Wikipedian? You are, you are the first I ever seen. Uh, they know about <laughs> it. Um, 
And that's a good point for uh, further uh, discussions uh, and uh, uh, to ask for a uh, uh, date uh, to speak about uh, other possibilities. I uh, do a lot of, uh, I, get, I take a lot of photos in Cologne, in museums, in uh, uh, press events, uh, and so on. And one thing I've learned, share the photos. I do not mean share the photos on Wikimedia Commons, that's uh, normal, that I do every day. But share the photos with institutions. I send them a link and say, here are my photos of the event, of the exhibition, of whatever you have taken, I have taken. Uh, and say, you can use them too. Oh, I can use them, yes. But how? How much do I have to pay? I say nothing. That's my next point. Explain Creative Commons. Be prepared, you have to explain it uh, again and again and again. Uh, the first time uh, I've explain, uh, I explained Creative Commons, I said, okay, uh, I, have to, uh, we have, I have to attribute your name, okay, and uh, what else? Can I use them for a brochure, for a catalog, for my website? Yes, you can, you may. Okay, I need to written it, uh, I need to written a uh, permission. No, you do not you do not need my written permission. You have the license, the Creative Commons license. Okay, but I have to pay. No, you don't do not have to pay. So it's an uh, it's, it's a bit fun for me. Um, and some and after a while they learn it and they use it. Uh, a few weeks ago I was on an uh, uh, meeting or not a meeting, um, is it uh, The, 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 the curator of the museum has spoke about his uh, latest ex exhibition and um, in, in, on a forum and I was uh, surprised that he used my photos uh, of the exhibition. Uh, not uh, correctly attributed, but mostly, so it's, it's okay, it was a small group. Um, and uh, as a next uh, hint or tip, uh, try to uh, speak on official conferences of the GLAMS. Um, the first step may be not very easy. Uh, I am in the lucky posi uh, position that um, we have in Germany Wikimedia Deutschland and um, institutions ask Wikimedia Deutschland, hey, uh, can, we, can we have a speaker for Wikipedia? If it's in Cologne or so on, uh, Lily or, or Barbara uh, uh, ask me if I have time. So if, uh, if I have time, uh, I go to the conference and speak about Wikipedia, Wikipedia, uh, Wikimedia Commons, free licenses, uh, differs uh, what I speak about. And uh, this, um, the follow-up, I will get <coughs> invitations uh, for other conferences, official conferences, uh, where I can uh, spread the word about uh, Wikipedia, free license, and so on. Uh, and in the following uh, um, project this month, we have had, um, have uh, last week, November, um, a talk on a conference, and uh, the curator of the library of the Bundeskunsthalle, it's a, it's a, a, a big German exhibition hall in Bonn, uh, invited me for a project. Um, I, I was there with this Barbara and uh, now we have uh, some good, uh, a, a, a project with some, uh, this is Ediaton and uh, later this year, uh, the permission for an exhibition uh, and so on. Uh, so it's uh, step by step, a small step, baby step we have learned today. Um, what's I like? What's I like? So, and I will give to Lili now. Thank you, Reinhold. Uh, I would like to add something here. Uh, this uh, project in the Bundeskunsthalle in Bonn is actually part of a project that we do, which is called Lama Tour. We just like to briefly talk about this one. Um, it actually aims to create relationships between the staff, like the curators, the scientific, staff of the museums or other cultural heritage institutions with land volunteers. So what we do is um, we try to uh, find existing initiatives um, of land volunteers and try to find out, okay, what's the problem here? Why wouldn't it 
uh, why wouldn't there be any uh, any events or any uh, collaborative work? And we try to support wherever it is, uh, wherever there's some necessity to do so. So it is really important to make the uh, the institutions, the staff, um, feel committed to to work with the um, volunteers, not only with us but also with the volunteers. Here we see um, an editathon in in Gerlitz, which took place. There's the volunteer and um, um, some uh, members of the staff who actually try to, to do their own work, um, create an account. And um, here's a restorer in a museum who shows some of the photographers um, from the Commons um, community objects uh, in the depots of the museum. And we also um, try to make them hold talks for the Wikipedians, so they have a broader basis to write articles, for example, and we also try to um, do uh, workshops for the scientific staff, so they would know about <coughs> what's Wikipedia. That's what uh, what I did in, in, in Bonn, for example. Yes, so far. In Sweden, earlier this year, the National Center for Architecture and Design, uh, which is one of the national museums in Sweden, invited us to have an open office at their public space. So for six weeks, staff from Wikimedia Sweden were there every day, the museum was open, to either help the staff from, from the museum, to invite uh, staff from other bombs that we're working with to come and talk to us, uh, we would help them upload images, do templates, uh, edit articles, do whatever they wanted to do while we were there. Uh, but also people from uh, visiting the museum would come up to us and sort of have a face on a Wikipedia because many of them have never met a Wikipedia before, as, as you said. And um, some of them had edited before and then were asking why was I reverted, why was the article I wrote deleted, I tried to do this, why did this happen? And, uh, people would create accounts and start editing because they had never thought of doing that before. Uh, this uh, at, at the museum at the time there were exhibition about Minecraft, so they also had servers up where people would build Minecraft cities, and they had built a, a big city box or with the boxes in the museum. So, so we also had an editathon around Minecraft at the time. Uh, not that many people showed up, but uh, some improvements were made to the articles. And uh, also we had other initiatives with uh, the project in Umeå, Umeåpedia, where we are working. So we invited people from the city of Umeå that's now living in Stockholm to come and edit the articles about Umeå. And uh, we did projects with the staff where they would uh, put data from the databases up on Wikipedia at the time. Uh, and with that, I'm leaving back to you, Lily. Um, yes. Thank you. So um, I would just like to briefly sum up um, some of the experiences that we made. Um, first, on this organizational level, um, it's really important that uh, you try to have a good time for your event. So. It, for example, never do it, do it during summer vacation or just uh, try to be aware of the necessities also of the cultural institutions. Try to pick a good point to, to do this um, sort of cooperations. Um, then it's important to set an agenda. As soon as uh, you have a, a date um, and on a project page, for example, with the GLAM community, um, try to, to set up an agenda so they would know, okay, what is going to happen there because otherwise they, they might not attend. Um, it's also important to um, define some themes. What will it be about? This is an experience I think many of us uh, made that it's important to uh, have a thematic approach um, on, on the event. Um, this is always very helpful. Um, and then it's important to plan enough time to actually uh, work, to actually edit, to actually have time to take pictures, or talk to the staff of the museum, since this is this is the goal. They have to get in touch and they have to have time to uh, to talk on a relaxed level. So this can be really frustrating if you have a packed program and no time to actually um, talk with the staff. Um, 
And concerning the quality of, of the black encounter, um, it's important to gain a shared understanding about the goals of these events. So it's extremely important that the cultural institutions themselves understand, okay, what is it good for? What is the value for me? This sounds very, very easy, but um, it's, it's really not, not the case. Sometimes they just want to do something with Wikipedia, as we all know, and they don't know, okay, this is going to be a lot, a lot of work. Um, so that's really important. And um, you should make sure there are defined roles. You should make sure, okay, the Glam is doing this and we are doing that and this is going to happen. Some lessons that we learned, um, they all come back to the question, okay, um, if you create such an activity, a cooperation, an event, an uh, editor, whatever, um, how can we make it sustainable? How can we make sure um, the people will keep in touch? And um, <coughs> we think it's extremely important to really um, find the key people in the institution um, that might be uh, good people to keep in contact with and then keep in contact with them on a personal level, on a continuous level. Um, this is really important. And then balancing the interests. It's always important to make both the glams and the community happy. So both sides would, uh, would be motivated to keep going. Um, then it's always important to keep the project pages alive. Um, so if, if there's something new that you can add, uh, some updates, some follow-up events, um, try to, uh, to reach out to the volunteers and tell them about it. Um, and uh, another very uh, important point is make the staff, um, the members of the staff get Wikipedians themselves. This is something we do um, in this Glamour Tour project, for example. Um, when we make the curators, for example, take part in a um, in an edited tone, we say, okay, but you have to create an account for this. You have to put your name down, otherwise it's not going to happen. And then they are, oh, okay, I'll try. And, and then um, they might just add something, upload some pictures themselves. And this is always very helpful um, to make them keep in contact with us. All right. So now um, we would really like to discuss with you about it. So if there are any questions or anything you would like to add, please do it now. Was that a... Yes. <laughs> I would like to agree with you. We didn't talk about it, but I do exactly the same thing as from the Dams, where I live from. I have exactly the same questions, exactly the same issues, exactly the same social. I think there is something really about what we do. Okay. Thank you. Uh, splendid. No, thank you. <laughs> Well, I have a question. Um, I'm interested to know, as, as you're all from uh, countries that speak languages other than English, whether you concentrate on editing purely in your native language or do you look to also work in articles in English or indeed in other languages? I can say from, from my perspective, we focus on Swedish, but we also try to, if it's an, a topic that's a, that has international interest, create an article in English about it as well because otherwise it won't be translated to, to other languages so you have to, to do some work to, to at least write the article in English or write something about it in English as well. Um, I think the most uh, people write in German, in the German Wikipedia, the people speak German. Uh, sometimes we get questions about I want an article, uh, can we do the article uh, of the museum in English, in Dutch, and other languages too. Uh, but then it's another point that's kind of not uh, um, about the language as such. The reason I ask is I have some experience um, of having articles, obviously written in English in projects that work on in this country, but also in German, in projects other than Germany. But when the object is from a different culture or is of interest to people in another country, and I always try to get it translated not into every language but into that language. So in, in Germany, we had a ship that was built in Hamburg but sold to Russia. So we got the article translated to Russian, and lots of Russian people would have been on holiday. I, I think it's, it's, it's worth uh, to, to keep this in mind uh, to translate an uh, article, but uh, I've not much experience with this. 
Well, we had uh, customers of two different languages. Um, we had participants from both language communities. And we also turned out that the public participants were Swedish and Danish as well. So we kind of had to source out and we had to really take that into account before we started. Uh, but I don't think I've seen any more of them <coughs> edit in English at all. Sure. Thank you. Yes, please. On, on very end of this, I, the only time I exchange contact with archives or museum is to ask them for one picture which would go then upload onto Wikipedia for anyone to use. So my question is, how can you depict the Sway people based a project if you're just seeking individual pictures of objects, uploading them as individual objects with no context for anybody who wishes to use them for announcement? How does that benefit the institution or the archive institution or the little museum? Does that make <coughs> For instance, you're working on an article and you can illustrate that article with a particular photograph from a museum or from an archive. So then <coughs> you can approach that museum or that archival institution and tell them, I am doing a project on you by telling them I would like two or three pictures that you have in order to illustrate two or three articles in Wikipedia. So it's not a project. How, how, can, you, how can you make this into a project and persuade them at that level? We're trying to, uh, the, the museums that we're working with, we're trying to get them to both look at that uploading a large quantity of images that they have, a, but also look at what articles are they interested in, what articles do they have images about that they could upload just one image to, to improve an article that doesn't have any look illustrations before. So, so we're kind of doing both approaches with uh, getting a lot of images if they want to donate that, but also uh, one or two images if, if they have specific requests for an article. article. I think uh, the museums or the archives, um, if you have, I don't know, I it. If, I, if you have pictures of objects, uh, of Wikimedia content without uh, embedded in embedded in the article, it's a worth of itself. Uh, the museum is named, uh, it's an institution like uh, Andy has mentioned it, it's important, really important. And I can tell the story from the other side. Some years ago, um, a curator from the well, City uh, Museum of Cologne uh, spoke to me and asked, and I said, very angry, uh, there are some uh, scans of old public domain graphics on Wikimedia Commons. I say, yes, uh, it's OK, yes, it's uh, public domain. Yes, but uh, our institution is not mentioned. Uh, they were very angry. And um, yes, she is right. She was right. Uh, I added the institution check and looked uh, through uh, the comments uh, if I found more images, uh, scans uh, from it, and added it. Uh, I, I told her very late and she was very happy. Now the uh, institution is mentioned, and everyone who stumbled about it, uh, not only we are Wikipedia, but also we are uh, Google search and so on, and now. Uh, know now that this is an article, an object uh, in, the, uh, in this museum. And uh, she has, uh, and every reader can uh, contact the museum to get a better copy or uh, to see the original There was a question down. Um, Thanks. I would like to add to that. We have a lot of relationship after us with the police who used to hire admission images, because we have a common site for bad colors, etc. So it's the other way around. Please use our images. We don't want to, have to see our paintings being molested by us. <laughs> do, do most institutions have uh, the opportunity to scan those objects themselves? Or do they want to use a lot of company to scan it? Well, that kind of depends on institutions, really. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, that kind of depends. 
depends on institutions themselves. Um, some institutions, like the National Library, is got they can do it all in house, but for example, other libraries can't have that. So, so if, if there's a, a small museum, how would they go about digitizing it? Well, there are um, initiatives by the um, Digital book scannings, that sort of thing. But that kind of depends on local museum policy, really. Um, yeah. For Cologne, I can say uh, the, the municipal, municipal uh, museums uh, to chat about in Cologne. I have an own department uh, where I pay for photographers who uh, document all the objects in high quality and without glass. Um, I do not have, so, uh, we do not have currently the uh, uh, photos and I hope we will get to soon. Not from the system. Uh, it's, uh, um, so, uh, yeah, okay. so, the city of Arca, Cologne, maybe you know, it's collapsed five years ago. Uh, or now all um, documents are scanned by themselves. <coughs> so if I understand correctly, if it's a small museum, it's usually going to be a problem which is a problem. It is a problem. It's basically a problem. Can I add to that? Um, in the UK, sometimes we will take equipment to an institution and borrow equipment from the UK. If that's not possible, you can give a grant to the chapter or to the foundation to buy equipment take places for that sort of purpose. So that's one possible solution. More experiences or questions you would like to share? All right, so thank you. And um, have a good uh, afternoon and see you all soon. achieving quite well actually on this session. We've had one minute um, to finish and we have a few minutes on this one. Uh, without further ado, we're going to just get set up for the next uh, speakers. Just wanted to check. We're all here. You know, maybe you might want to move in, get some energy. Um, I'll remind you that after this, there will be a group photo by the lake side. So if you're interested in being in a Greek photo of the Ethiopian Gila, just bring yourself down and we'll get the um, process. Okay. Said earlier at the beginning, our speakers don't want to buy.
uh, done a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, editing, tra editing training sessions. There was one here on uh, yesterday morning, I think, downstairs. Uh, mostly for uh, people who've never edited before. There are relatively, there's some that are for sort of advanced editing, but they're mostly for people who've never edited and want to edit. And uh, they're sometimes called editing workshops, sometimes they're called editathons, uh, but they uh, are typically, you can't really do it in less than an hour and a half. It's better if you go up to three hours. So I guess uh, that's, a, that's a big thing in the movement. And we also know that the uh, number of editors who keep on editing that comes out of those sessions is pretty low. That's uh, a, a general experience. Okay, I'm just going to let's uh, all introduce ourselves. I'm uh, John Byrne. I usually use a John Bod. Uh, I've been with Peter for a long time, mostly involved with the Community UK, and I'm with Peter in residence, uh, currently at Cancer Research UK, previously at the Royal Society, which is the National Academy of Sciences here. Um, and so I've done many of these. I'm Jamie Anstey, I'm from the Library Specialist at OED and Foundation. I'm Andrew Gray, I was the Wikipedia University British Library, during which time I did an astonishing number of these workshops, most of which probably didn't go any good. At least not by the basics, right? Okay, yeah, so Jamie's going to just give us very quickly her, her real thoughts. Okay, so we did a pilot um, volunteer recording round last year, I'm not sure if many of you heard of it. Um, well, a lot of people haven't been tracking, we did ask, hey, for those of you who haven't been tracking your data, please report to us voluntarily so we can understand what workshops are doing. Um, okay, that's better. Um, so essentially, sorry about this, I don't know what happened, but we only received reports from eight program leaders, eight people who do workshops, and there was only for 16 different workshops. Um, these were the ones that they had username lists and they had some sort of information about budgets. It was highly variable, but overall the goals were educating the public, teaching and recruiting new volunteers to edit, right? Um, so within that, we have a lack of inputs in reporting. Only five people were able to have a budget or reported a budget. The others left it blank. We don't know if they just didn't know the budget or if there was no budget. Um, so only two workshops reported a non-zero dollar budget. Um, it was kind of surprising to see the budget for those workshops. One was five dollars and eighty-eight five U.S. dollars, five eighty-eight U.S. dollars um, per participant, and the other was eighteen U.S. dollars per participant. That one that was most high also had thirty hours of preparation time recorded for that workshop coordinator and coordinating the people to show up. While both of those had about forty people turn out, um, only one of them actually lasted and was active editing. So only six people reported the hours that were input of these 16 projects. So we don't know how many people are putting in all of these excess hours in coordination, but it's important to recognize that it should be something that you want to reduce and minimize the amount of resources for that particular outcome. Seems up front. Another common tracking and reporting gap is that out of the 230 usernames that were reported, only 86, 87 were new users. Okay. So what is a new user? When do we define what a new user is? Technically, it's by when they create their account. But some people create an account two weeks or one week or whatever before a workshop because you know if you get too many people in a room, you're not going to be able to sign that many people up that day. And what happens then is that you don't know what their username is. Um, so we do encourage you also, if you're doing this kind of thing, to get their email addresses. They may also change their, their username because they forget what it was or they forget their password. It's good to follow up if you're really trying to start new people. They aren't going to have the connections and they probably just want to, you're going to lose who they are even if they are retained. Um, so, uh, the next thing. Uh, there was no reporting at all of, or measurement reported that anyone's measuring the skills that are being taught or if people are leaving the room feeling like they can edit. It's really important that that is captured because if they are leaving and not knowing what to do, then you know it's not working. But if we don't know, and we wait until we see, did anyone convert to a new editor? Is anyone going to become active? It's way too late to do anything to fix it. You've now had this chance and it's gone. 
So in terms of retention of active new editors, out of the 87 usernames, which was partly uh, some were invalid because sometimes there was like reports of uh, an, an email address essentially. So someone put their email address and they assumed that that must be the beginning is going to be their username. You could kind of see this from the files that were shared. Um, only two were active at six months. So uh, we don't know how many of those are just because they changed their username. Um, we don't know how many of those were because they're invalid. But we do know that, but it wasn't the majority that were invalid. So while they are very popular, we don't really know what they're doing because we aren't measuring with or teaching the skills. And if we just wait for the end output, we're not seeing it. So we need more voluntary reporting. If you're doing workshops, please um, try to track better. We need better tracking. I know a lot of people don't know how to track or what to track. There are a lot of tools and uh, resource suggestions in the evaluation portal on Meta. I will pass out stickers that has the address for those who are interested. Um, but you'll find example tracking forms and suggestions. We also have ongoing reporting and um, sharing of data, so you can report up to us any time of year, but we will be doing a um, push and an ask for um, more data in September, so please do look for that if you have data to report. And of course, we do more monthly hangouts for people who are more interested in evaluating. So, the most important lesson learned is that we need to experiment with the workshop designs. Some people are doing um, now regular series, trying to keep new people coming back maybe once a month. Maybe they don't get all the skills they needed the first time. Um, some people have started implementing skill surveys as an exit. Others are really hands-on workshops, so not only making sure to pair it with an edit-a-thon, making sure they get to actually try, they get online and they make an edit. Obviously, they are more likely to do that on their own if they actually do it. Um, well, we would assume, still needs to be measured and proved. Uh, workshops targeting existing groups is what a lot of people are doing, um, but we need to understand when you do that, is it a presentation, is it really supposed to get one person in the room, or is it supposed to get all of the people, and what is the expectation? So maybe we're not expecting all of them to become editors, right? So let's understand what the goal of different types of workshops are, and we need to gather that feedback from participants so we know what we actually did. Um, this is our address, I'm going to pass that the stickers, it's also on the bottom. Okay, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so uh, the metrics are important, but I think we also need to uh, think particularly with uh, more uh, online, uh, more options for online editing. I think most established editors, in fact, didn't learn through a face-to-face -face training session. Uh, certainly I didn't, or, or Andrew. Uh, they just started doing it online and we are uh, developing uh, more sort of up-to-date online webinar, you know, kind of options. So we have to ask, is face-to-face -face editing training, which we know currently produces low measurable returns, are there, are there other benefits that it brings or should we just abandon it? Uh, and certainly, we, we've been talking about it earlier, our experience, Andrew and myself working large with Wikipedia residents in large institutions, is that the institutions like it, the institutions want it, and often you are giving the institution, administrators in the institution, a taste of something which they don't intend to go on doing themselves, but they're testing the experience sometimes to see if they're going to offer it to other people inside their organization or within their interest groups and the rest of it, or students on courses or whatever. Um, and you're also just uh, doing PR, or, you know, raising awareness. Uh, and there are other, there are, I think, other benefits, which of course are, are terribly hard to quantify uh, and measure, which, is, uh, which causes the foundation problem. Um, although, I mean, the, the costs, when you look at it in terms of cost per new editor, uh, $18 is pretty high, but on the other hand, you're probably not actually talking about a large amount of money, and then you don't know what the other people in the session uh, took away from it and will spread around. Certainly that was my experience at the Royal Society, where the sessions we had got a lot of people from other uh, learning societies, 
you know, who are academies of uh, different branches of the science or from universities. And there was a very definite, uh, they looked to the Royal Society as the National Academy of the Sciences. There was a definite kind of spreading effect, uh, which is extremely hard to quantify. Andrew, you would? Well, from my perspective, when we did a lot of these projects, we, we approached them from the angle of we are a library. What do libraries do? They teach people skills. And Wikipedia is very badly understood, so we said we were going to do interesting workshops because people wanted to, wanted to, to see and hit button, you know, quite like that. They asked for it. Um, but we did so almost with an expectation, so that should be about teaching information literacy. And the problem is the information literacy of understanding how Wikipedia works and how it's not that scary is something that is really very hard to, to quantify retrospectively, unless we send a follow up question and say, do you understand more about Wikipedia? Um, there are, and so this is a very difficult thing to measure. We can't measure the conversion rate. We also, I feel, we can look at other things that these workshops are doing. As John says, they, they, you know, they make institutions happy. Institutions ask us to run them, we run them, everyone's happy. They are something that volunteers quite like doing. So maybe even if it has no effect whatsoever on the outside world, maybe it's actually doing our community some good. You know, maybe it's bringing people in and getting, giving something to do that's exciting and talk to people that's great. Um, we can look at sort of other intangible benefits. Um, are we actually producing skills for those contributors? You know, the, the existing users are going to do stuff, are they filling off being better? Are we, in some ways, very, very carefully, being an awful lot of me effort into measuring the one thing that we know is going to be bad results? You know? yeah, it, it's, it's, almost, it's almost like we're, we're, we carefully select the thing that makes us look worse and put a lot of effort into measuring it. But the question is, can we measure these other things? Should we measure these other things? And how do we measure these other things? I mean, I can see there are a lot of people here I know have got very good experience. It's all about very intimate and not speaking. Leading training. Is there, a, is there someone uh, with a uh, good amount of experience who would like to put in a contribution? Andy, what's the prize? Andy, you might have got things on the wing. Uh, I'll some anecdotal evidence, which can just simply ask to speak about it. Or rather, perhaps I should say, cast down to Stand up. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Just for a minute. Something that could be Um I have some anecdotal evidence which casts doubt on the uh, statistical evidence. I'm sure a lot of collegiate work went into gathering it, but let me explain. I know some people that I've trained have signed up uh, in the library or the uh, archive or museum where I've trained them with a username that all their colleagues know and they've completed the training and they've started a short stub article. And because I know them personally, I know they've gone home and created another account in their own name where they edit about their favourite football team, or their favourite rubbish pop singer or Pokemon or whatever it is that they're interested in because they don't want their colleagues to know what their private interests are. So we're not seeing those editors. I know people who I've trained to edit who work behind the counter of an archive and every time a member of the public goes in and says, I'd like to research Mr. So-and-so who lived in my house two years, hundred years ago. So, oh, if you find anything interesting about it, please put it on Wikipedia, here's how. But they never edit again themselves, but they're still a great advocate for us. I know people I've trained who when their manager says, you shouldn't have anything to do with Wikipedia, it's all unverifiable rubbish are able to say, oh no, that's not how it works. Look, here's how a reference works in the debate. Here's how you can check the facts. Here's how you can put the edit history. They may never edit, but they're still doing this big favor. I, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I, I'm certainly, uh, in, in, this, in the science sector, I started to, uh, thinking, okay, mid-career researchers, team leaders, they're too busy to do much editing. I should offer them a package where I explain how they can review articles, Keep in project tool pages, offer advice, this kind of thing. Uh, and I've offered both the Royal Society of Council Research UK to scientists. I've offered that as a package option. Or I say we can do that and then we'll do hands on editing training in the session. And almost always they pick the longer option. They want to know how to edit, even if they know and I know so they're actually going to be too busy to carry on doing it, and they enjoy seeing the referencing and finding out that there are tool pages and, and all And to that. be fair, I, I, I'm sorry, I've really been uh, critical of some of your work, and 
I don't think it's the fact that that survey has failed to measure these things. I think they are unmeasurable things. Yes. And we can only ever know anecdotally that they've gone. We can't measure them. Thanks, Andy. Uh, so, I'll, I'll come on. Yeah, I'll, I'll, so if you so come out voice, you can. One little comment is you can get Wikipedia to allow an unlimited number of counts to be created from your IP address. So if you're expecting 200 people to show up, you can get rid of the five limit. Um, yeah. You need yeah. to email someone important. If I'm not, I only you can. But it's a really tricky thing to do. It, it, it is a bit complicated. You need yeah, but if you are rating, if you are rating acceptance, this is a nice thing to do so that your user can actually all create a new account. I mean, what what I usually do is to ask them to sign up in advance, which of course then messes up, tends to mess up the metrics again. But that's not. But there's solutions for that. Yeah, don't go into that. Okay. Do you ask after? Yeah. yeah. So, hi, I'm Dan. Um, I work for the foundation, but um, I've also run a lot of um, training events. And I think it's important to remember why we run these training events, right? Like, we, we, it's easy to say that it's about actually get, getting new editors and things, but, like, really that's actually a proxy for the goal of increasing the amount of content that's available on Wikipedia. And I've run a training event before where we went in with a list of, I think it was about 15 um, female fellows of the Royal Society who didn't have articles. Which meant that oh, actually, actually long time, yeah. that's, uh, it was only a year or so ago actually. And um, interestingly, by definition, they're notable because they have been fellows of the Royal Society. Like it explicitly says in the notability policy, like if you're a member of the Royal Society, then you an article. By the end of that editors on, all of those women had articles and they were all referenced. Like even if none of those people ever edit Wikipedia again, we've increased the amount of content that's available on Wikipedia. I would call that success, even if none of them would ever edit again. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're just finding it in those terms, then you do have to start, you know, looking at the, you know, dollar cost per participant. But I don't think that's, you know, I don't think that's the end of the story. We also I, I think think we can, sorry, uh, sorry, I'll just go sit down after this, but um, I'm not saying we can't do better, and that there may be better ways of doing it, right? But I think, so far, I'm pretty pleased with how things have gone. Yeah, I mean, women in science, actually, is the, is the, the surefire hit, certainly yeah. in the scientific sector. You get great crap, you know, it's really easy to book the events. Uh, they're really keen, they're really enthusiastic, they're really pretty, you know, uh, which is nice because the trainers and yours middle aged males. Uh, so everyone's happy. I'm and they, and they, <laughs> they create, they, they create yeah. uh, the, the last uh, women's one we had, uh, I think, seven or nine did you knows out of a single three hour session. One, uh, on. one thing to, to quickly throw in there, of course, is I think. Jimmy touched on this, is the distinction between what we consider a training event and what we consider an editing event. Yeah. And in some ways, the ways in which we're trying to measure the outcomes for the two are quite different. Mm -hmm. So if you've got something that's focused on content creation, it's not focused on training. And because many of our public outreach focused content creation events are focused towards your public, they have a training element. But it's very hard to differentiate to then, on the one hand, we have a purely training event, on the other hand, we have a purely existing yeah. event or content event, and the grey area in the middle is very hard to define. I mean, do you want to say more on that? Or is it? Um, Thanks. Cheers. Yeah, so, so there's not a whole lot of fidelity in the design of any of these things, so we're very much talking about them, like everybody's workshops are the same. And it's really important to also understand that sometimes it's more of a presentation, and it's that case where you might get one person who's interested in finding out how to edit after, but it might not actually get them the skills in editing. Um, the other thing is we know that some people have models, especially related to women in science, like um, some of you might know Emily Temple was um, been working on a toolkit, and she does workshops all the time, and her whole thing is getting them to write a biography. Um, and that editing. tends to be the, and that's also mm -hmm. the ones over here that and in France, that tends to be what it ends up as. And it's, um, uh, you know, it's been tremendously successful. It's, it's the one, in terms of content, uh, there have been an awful lot of events, and it is, I speak from experience, having spent a lot of time trying to find notable women uh, who didn't have articles, who worked out about American, you know, director of American women scientists in the 1970s or whatever that uh, the main list is. Uh, it's actually getting harder and harder. There, there are some around, but they, the low-hanging fruit have gone. Doug, you're looking at... Yes, John. Um, just a couple of points I'd like to make. Um, I, I'm very interested in this topic, as you, you probably realise. I, I do a fair amount of training in the UK. Can everybody hear me okay? I don't have to move. Yep. <clears throat> well, 
two things, two things that I'm starting to come to conclusions about. The first thing is that I believe that the reason why we have poor energy retention following either editathons or training workshops is because of the treatment that the editors subsequently encounter on Wikipedia. Yeah. And I think that the problem there is to make sure that people come out of your sessions equipped to not have their work reverted or deleted. And if you can avoid those two, which, which would be very, very dispirited, those two very dispirited possible outcomes for people's work, then you've done a, a good job. And my impression over this last year, when I spent far more time on trying to make sure that people have those two basic skills, of, of making sure that they, they look like the proper editor, so they have a use page, and they always add citations and references to edits that they make. If they can have those two skills from the start, I'm getting the impression that I'm getting a higher retention rate. Now, if you talk to people anecdotally who you know who have taught but don't seem to be editing anymore, they'll always tell you they don't have time. It's possible that there's a time problem, that people, we need to find ways to get, to encourage people to have time to edit. But I do believe that the, the, the discouragement I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think you're issues. right, but we do, uh, we do, you know, if you look at the edit histories of the people who've been on your events, uh, an awful lot of them just never edit again. Yeah. So they don't edit again to be put off. Probably if they did edit again, they might get put off, but they just don't. So, but I mean, I think, I think you're absolutely right, I and mean, it is something important to incorporate. I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to get it up from 5% to 10%. Yeah, one quick thing to bear in mind is that we do know that we have a terrible retention rate for face-to-face -face training sessions. We also know we have a terrible retention rate full stop. Yes. 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 So I mean, they're actually quite comfortable. Okay, yeah. Okay. We have uh, yeah. Just thinking outside the box, you presented it as a, a means to an end. In other words, you teach in order to have new editors, responsible editors, who will continue and expand the work. But you can also see it as an end in itself to teach. You can have communities, where, where, where I'm involved in my local community, older people, retired people, you can have a whole session on editing, which is an, an end in itself, which is bringing older people in touch with something like Wikipedia. They will enjoy the process, they will enjoy the explanation, the social event, they will enjoy learning something, perhaps having a peep in what their children or grandchildren are into, and they will never touch the computer again. However, it becomes a point of reference, it becomes a point of talking. So therefore, seeing face-to-face -face contact, face-to-face -face education as an, uh, as an end in itself, I think is very valuable. And Wikipedia does lend itself, because you can actually tune it to what that particular audience is interested in. Might be interested in the First World War, might be interested in teacups and teapots or what have you. So but that is the, the I, think, I think that's kind of what we're saying, but, but perhaps not in that particular context. I mean I mean this is also the context that we have we don't have enough active volunteers and the active volunteers we have in most places are actually pretty stretched. So we do have to think about are we, you know, are we uh, uh, it's often quite time consuming you have to travel and so on. So that's the kind of context we're thinking of. Yeah. Uh, I just have an idea regarding the retention rate. Uh, what, if you know what uh, people are, there, what usernames are there, uh, why can't you just watch their talk pages for a while and sort because of maybe nothing basic. happens. They, 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 no uh, problem, never come back. If, if some people come back, maybe you can increase the retention rate by monitoring them and making making sure their experiences are not so bad. Of course, there are all numbers, so the time speed advantage yeah, yes. yeah. But the, 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 typically, they don't come back after yeah. a few days. You know, that's certainly the average. They might do something the next couple of days. It varies. I mean, I mean, there was a uh, actually Cancer Research World in 2011 had a session that um, I think Doug helped train. We came and train. Actually, they were really good. Uh, most of them kept going for 
several months, and they were really you know, expert people, so they were adding really good stuff. But after 12 months, in fact, none of them were, none of them were still editing, but they were pushing, you know, they were looking for funding to fund the position that I'm now doing. So that's actually a really kind of classic, um, you know, you can say, I mean, in a way, they were kind of interested in Wikipedia before they had the editing training. That's why they had the editing training they organized. But, uh, you know, that is a sort of indirect result. Okay, Any, anyone else? Uh, okay, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering why we're having this discussion. I feel that we're like people in the Middle Ages, in, in uh, 16, no, no, 674, saying, why, why should we bother to tell the masses how to write? Why should we teach them how to write? We take a group of boys, because it was always boys at that time, we, we give them quills and vellum, we show them the alphabet and the words, none of them grow up to be monks, none of them illustrate manuscripts. Uh, you should teach people how to edit Wikipedia because that's the way life is going. Um, I've been vaguely involved with EdWiki. I'm a very poor editor. I've got two and a half articles to my name and a few minor edits. But I'm still interested. I still, I probably will write some other articles in the future, but I know how to do it. I know how to tell people how to do it. It's something that you need to have embedded in your whole culture. Never mind whether in your metrics, they go on to do editing or not. I don't think this, this is the right discussion. I think the discussion is empowering, enthusiastic, enthusiastic, yeah, and spreading the word. I but think that is the discussion we're having, though, where I say what is mentioning, are, what is the goal? Are you trying to maybe get one of those 40 people, and that is your goal being met? Is your goal to make them just know about Wikipedia? Is it more about presenting the idea versus actually converting editors? And it's important also to identify what the real goals are individually, because if it, is it skills? Is it just letting them have exposure to how it's done and then it can be done? We, we need to develop the measures and so, the goals. As, as a movement, we have been telling ourselves for a very long time, it's about bringing in new editors. Whether or not we actually have ever sat there and interrogated that question, I don't know what I'm telling ourselves that. Sorry, but OK, we've only got a couple of minutes, but James, a uh, very quick couple of very quick. Well, thank you. Um, so as far as uh, the purpose of an editor fund goes, I think you can consider new editors as one measure, but I think there are other measurements that matter, such as if you're working with an organization, how many organizations can you possibly network with? So like for, exactly, our, organization, yeah. for our organization in Washington, it's about it's more about showing off to these organizations, hey, we're here, we're real people. But also as far as the editor retention question goes, I think it's more than a problem of implementation than rather is the program fundamentally possible. And what we found in our research is that it's not enough to have an event. There has to be a lot of tie to other things. For example, one event has to have already another event scheduled. So if you go to the event on December 5th, it has to be said, if it does it, we have another event on December 5th. Okay, that's, I mean, that's an interesting approach, but it does take a lot of time. Yeah. And also social... Um, <laughs> Sorry, guys, we, we, we're in the last thing. We need to fine-tune our retention, how we define retention. And for instance, we need to address one problem. Perhaps first-time editors or contributors are intimidated by the fear of rejection. So well, that, that, that's certainly that's so an issue. So yeah, there can be micro-editing sessions or editing capsules with tasters and amplifier editing. So in case I have, let's say, half an hour, I just add two, three, or four new references, or add a caption to an image, or do what I call bite-sized editing. Okay. So it yep. lures the contributor and encourages him for further editing engagement. First. I mean, that's great if, you, if you've got the time, but it takes a, a lot of time. Secondly. Yeah. Sorry, I think, I think we, we really have to go for quick points now. That was uh, uh, your quick point. So if you want, no, to, on, if you want to reduce the, yeah. uh, the cost of editing, for example, if I know the Borough Library holds training capsules, 90-minute sessions for arts, for humanities, or any other subjects, 
Yeah, I I think so. I think we should also look more to the PR effect uh, about uh, <laughs> making Wikipedia known as something uh, that people can get it because we have lots of users, but they don't know what Wikipedia are. Uh, I had a very great experience once of an Alpine hut where I took along my uh, netbook and I edited it there. And people are saying, like, what are you doing there? You know, hey, I'm editing this field. This is how it's done. And then, you know, the people... Yeah, I, th I think that's very true. I think, I think uh, <laughs> we kind of... Uh, uh, young people, undergraduates at university, five years ago, there had been so much publicity about Wikipedia all of which, you know, media stories, and they all said in the first paragraph, anyone can edit, it's amazing, it's risky. Actually, young people are losing that awareness, and you do find people who are quite surprised that they could just go, you know, even though there's notices all over the page. Okay, I think we have to leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks to you to all the speakers. The next is really now a photo outside.